You're watching Drake Wing Gaming. Enjoy the video. Hello everyone, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. So if you know me on Twitter, the Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming at you with another Let's Play episode of Far Beyond the World. So the last place we left off, Rannick had unfortunately decided he had de begun his journey and he had departed from the village. And so we are kind of left to our own devices for a little, for uh, like a few days at least. And oh, I wonder what's going to happen to Orion in the meantime. I'm very curious to see what he decides to fill his free time with. But anyway, guys, let's jump right back into it. Please enjoy the video. Okay, there we go. All right. <clears throat> Start the timer. Alarm chain, you're up. All right, let's do it. Apparently she was a sorceress of great power back in the Age of Men. From context, I assume humans once ruled over this world, although the book so far doesn't state what exactly caused the situation to change. Frey was part of that of... Frey was part of what the book refers to as a pantheon, a group of exceptionally gifted individuals who guided early humans. It seems this book is a part of a series, as it often refers to another title called Twilight of Men, which apparently deals with breaking of the pantheons. It would seem Frey's clique wasn't, only, wasn't the only one overseeing the development of mankind. Different pantheons looked after their own tribes, often competing with one another. I can't help but feel like all of this is vaguely familiar. Anyway, Frey had her last stand in the lands east of here, where she fell, where she fell defeated by the Aspects, whatever that means. Ever since, the area was forever known as Freyfall, to commemorate the valiant, the valiant defense of, of the sorceress and her attempts to save mankind from targeted genocide. Thanks to her noble sacrifice, the Aspects weren't able to wipe out all of humanity and were forced to retreat into hiding. The Aspects. Huh. From the ashes of their once mighty empire, the remaining humans formed, formed what is called successor kingdoms, petty realms which forever, a after, which forever after struggled to survive against the tides of beast folk. I shut the book with confusion. This leaves more questions than gives me answers, and I don't think I like to learn that I'm an extinct species. It just doesn't feel right. Vague familiarity aside, this now reads like a poorly written fiction. However, since I'm here, I cannot help but feel unsettled by this information. Am I really from this world? Am I a part of a dying race? The bigger question is, why would the Aspects, whoever they are, want to wipe out humanity to begin with? Sure, we have some issues, but... These wolves don't seem to be saints either. If there are some supervising beings looking over this world, I think one verbal or two written ones would be a better policy than skipping straight to global-scale genocide. As I'm about to open the book again, I hear a knocking on the outer door and assume it's Vool. It's been a while, so this means Rannick is most likely left already. When I open the door, I'm greeted with Verissa instead. Oh, you're back. You almost sound disappointed. She chuckles, pushing past me. I promised Rannick I'd get the dress done, so here I am. The female points to the chair and unpacks from her pouch a white thread with a shiny needle embedded into the spool. Get up. I need to readjust the height after Vool manhandled you. He hardly touched me. I smile awkwardly as I walk onto the chair. Kind of you to say, but that's beside the point. Verissa picks a few pins and secures them between her lips. She tugs at the fabric, making sure that it aligns properly again. When she's happy with the new edge, she simply fastens the she simply fastens the dress bit by bit. I let her work without interruption until eventually she is done. Right, take it off, but gently. We don't want it to get crooked. I nod and proceed with caution. Once the dress is in her possession, she simply unfolds it in her paws and seats herself comfortably at the table. I watch as she strings the thread through the needle, slowly getting down to sewing. How is the spectacle then? She muses as she pulls the needle through the fabric. Not that bad, actually. I mutter uncomfortably. Hmm. She sounds unconvinced, but I really don't want to add to her misgivings about Vool. True, he might be a bit short-fused, but I'm sure he has his reasons for it. And so far, it seems that scolding him for it doesn't yield any des desirable results. He's not that bad, just grumpy. Ha! She laughs sarcastically, her paw going up and down with a thread dancing merrily in the air in long waves. That's one way of putting it. Vul is very much a powder keg. A slightest spark can set him off in the most spectacular of ways. I frown, really saddened to hear that. Was he always that way? Oh, yes. Vul is pretty much enraged ever since he was a pup. I've gotten quite immune to his tantrums. For your sake, I hope you will too. He, he won't harm me. I say with utmost confidence. After all, he did swear on the moonstone and so far I have no reason to doubt him. Maybe, but anxiety caused by his rampage isn't, isn't exactly healthy, either. I could sense your heart from the other room. He had you in a proper state. She gives me a concerned look, and I have to concede. He is stressing me a lot. I 
I honestly wonder how he does it. The female sighs, returning to her task. Huh? Rannick, how he deals with him is beyond me. I'm sure it's because Vool is worth the hassle. I can see her struggle to subdue a smile, and she sighs again, this time more amused and resigned. He does make it seem like it at times, doesn't he? But like with any delusions, this one wears off quite fast. Usually by his own choice. Her expression returns to a slight scowl as she continues looping the thread through the, dre through the dress's edge. It's clear those two have some issues, especially with Vool's now clear infatuation with the female. She leaves no doubt that the feeling is unreciprocated. I wonder if it's just the way it is, or perhaps something he has done. He seems very much keen on you. Keen on me? She blinks, giving me a confused look. No. I'd say he's keen on the idea of me. What's the difference? The lack of trying to understand who I actually am for a start. Ever since he proclaimed his interest in me, it was solely on the fact that I strike his fancy. Small, slender, curvy, white like the moon. That's all he seems to me. That's all he sees me as. She scoffs and her voice betrays a hint of hurt. Seriously, what idiot would dump a fortune into a damn silk dress? Especially on the assumption that as a female I should wet myself in excitement at the sight of it. She ruffles the garment in my direction. This here? This is an insult, not a gift. I'm not a den wife. I will never be a polite little mother raising other wolves' pups. If he had spent at least some time of his day to actually get to know me rather than objectify me... She almost stifles a growl, her paws tensing around the fabric. She's taking this very personally. Every wolf is the same. I don't know what I expected. Look at you. Versa scoffs, waving her paw at me. Wait, why is she bringing me into this? Kaylin, indeed. That's all they see. A tight fi She cuts off, looking at me in surprise that she actually went that far. I just sit there, as, I, as if petrified by Medusa's gaze. Versa simply throws her head to the side and coughs nervously. Sorry, I didn't mean to imply anything. I'm saying, we're more than just our looks. I hastily nod, <laughs> wishing I could just explode into a cloud of dust and disappear. The female returns to her task and simply continues sewing, more determination in her movements betraying she wants to be done with this as fast as possible. I share her sentiment. This little rant went sideways quick and put me on a rather uncomfortable spot. I don't hold a grudge. Clearly she's upset by the way Vol treats her. I also think there's a hint of regret, as if she expected more of the male. Perhaps his feelings towards her aren't as un unreciprocated as I initially thought. But what's more important, I think she's suspecting something between me and Rannick. First a conversation at the moonshine, now this. I appreciate her discretion and apparent supportiveness, but I have to disagree. Perhaps Vool does objectify her a lot, and Rannick's choice for my nickname seems now seems now tad unfortunate in the context, but the Grey Wolf is different. If anything, me being a human seems to trouble Rannick as much as I'm being troubled by him being a wolf. Yes, there's a surface-level attraction, but from our heart to heart, I think it's clear we're both drawn to our personalities. I feel sorry for what she goes through, especially since Vool seems very much capable of more. We just sit there in silence while she finishes her handiwork. Once she's done, she bites off the thread to separate it from the needle. Right, I'm not professional, but this should hold as long as you're not rough with it. She pa <clears throat> she passes me back the garment and I put it on. <coughs> oh, sorry about that, guys. It falls freely to my knees, and I must admit I enjoy my new tunic. Since Rannick isn't here, you're not required at the feast. She states matter-of-factly, and, and I take it as you're not wanted there. Oh, okay. Vol should bring you some food in the evening. Her very sudden shift of demeanor betrays she's uncomfortable, but most likely feeling that she has said too much. Despite wanting company, I decide not to hold her back. This was quite too personal, even for my liking. Stay safe, Verissa utters, collecting her things and rushing towards the doors. She pulls on the handle and cracks them open. The female stops for a moment, looking back at me almost as if she wanted to say something, but instead she just sighs and shakes her head. Bye, I mutter, watching as the door closes and I'm alone again. Oh, okay, what we got here? Oh, well, what's this? Notices your plot development. <laughs> I spend my time between figuring out how to start the fire and deciphering more of the fanta that fantastical book. To my own surprise, I managed to get the hearth going after just an hour of tinkering with Rennick's antiques. I nibble on what's left from the breakfast and wash it down with some beer while I continue my read. Apparently the lions are one of the main reasons why my kin are such a rare sight. They arrived in Avalon bent on conquering and establishing their own kingdom, subjugating all the folk living here. Their first target were the humans of Freyfall, whom lions viewed as inferior and unfit to live in their new domain. 
It laid waste to the land, butchering entire towns and villages, finally standing at the very gates of the human capital in these lands. Freyrun. Freyrun was the largest city on the continent, grand and wondrous, a last vestige of the humanity of old. The lions had no means of breaching the city with its massive stone walls, so at first they resorted to starving it out. But the humans of Freyfall stood firm, resupplying their city through the river. Impatient, the lions decided to terrorize the populace into submission. Each night it would catapult half-eaten human cadavers into the city, aimed at breaking the spirit of the defenders. But the humans stood firm, dazed, then weak. In the end, it wasn't their spirit that failed, but their bodies. Sickness and disease overwhelmed the city, and after nearly a year of siege, Freyrun capitulated. To show others the price of such brave defiance, the lions put the city to the sword and torch. What follows is a detailed account of rape and plunder, with some paragraphs going as far as calling the lions kin-eaters, something which seems to be one of the most monstrous stigmas another kin can bear. Jesus. I must admit, I'm relieved to learn that cannibalism between the, friend, the kins is frowned upon, but equally unsettled that lions resorted to devouring those they considered lesser. And it would seem humans weren't the only ones on the menu, but the sylvan folk as well. No wonder other kin rebelled. The rebellion itself is a, mum, is, a mum, is a muddled jumble of dates and events, which spanning a century are easy to confuse. Despite being lost half the time, I finally realize why tigers are brought up so much in my context. After the success of the Tiger Rebellion, Freyfall became a province of the Tiger Realm, and although now mainly populated by tiger folk, humans are still a sizable minority there. It also seems they're very much respected and, according to the book, partake in the governments of the, t of the Tigeron. Tigeron? Tigeron? Of Tigeron. I guess a human tigery noble isn't such a crazy idea after all. As for the lions, tigers have banished them, forcing entire prides into exile to leave the continent and to never return. A fitting in for those murdering monsters. If at least half of the stuff I read is true, then I definitely do not want to meet a lion. I closed the book, trying to digest this information. It also seems so surreal and very much out of place. I don't feel part of this world. Some of the information is familiar, but my head is also filled with jumble that with a jumble that doesn't fit the context. I'm more and more convinced that I have somehow stepped through the looking glass. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Okay. What was that transition? I stay like that for a while, just enjoying the fire and musing. With my mind sated with a lot of new knowledge, both general and personal, I have an easy time keeping my thoughts in check. Hopping between Rannick struggles and Varissa's heartaches, I get to avoid the darkness stalking the recesses of my mind. In fact, focusing on their hardships seems almost as effective at grounding me in reality as Rannick himself is. I feel sorry for the male. I've been giving him a lot of unnecessary flack without even considering how hard his day-to-day -day life really is. I'm also a bit disappointed with Vool. I hope to get some time to check the ground around him. Despite Varissa's words, he does seem to feel something towards the male, and it would, and it would be a shame if he ruined his chances by acting like a toxic male. I have to suspect he's only doing it because he thinks it's expected of him. Just as I'm slowly dozing off, I hear knocking that stirs me up again. Speak of the devil. Piglet. I rush to the doors and open them hastily. The wolf walks in, holding a sizable pastry in his hands. Nice, you even managed to burn the place down. Nice, you even managed not to burn the place down. Steak and kidney pie. He places it on the table and looks to me uncomfortably. I'm sorry I took this long. They wouldn't let me leave the feast. In fact, I have to head back there, so I can't stay. Oh, it's okay. I'm slightly disappointed, but I muster a brave smile. Don't give me that, kid. If you're of age, you can deal with one day on your own. I didn't say anything. <laughs> but you were about but you were but you were about to think it. I chuckle at his accusation. Either way, you better get some sleep. I'll be coming to fetch you just before the dawn. Huh? Why? You're coming with me to the butchery. To do some forced labor. I grumble, but he's having none of my snark. To have some company as Rannick prescribed it. I don't have the luxury of fucking around in someone else's house. He scoffs at me and walks back towards the door. Seriously, get rested, because I don't want you bitching over my ears the whole day tomorrow. Okay, okay, I will. I just wave him away and allow the wolf to leave. Once he's gone, I just sit down and take a curious glance at the pie. It's still warm and slightly steamy. I fetch myself one of the forks Rannick's borrowed from the villa and dig in. However, seeing how succulent and juicy it is on the inside, I feel rather uncomfortable eating it in my brand new silk dress. I look around and locate a hand towel on the cupboard. I use it as a napkin to safeguard my fancy garment and continue with my food. The pie is very hearty, with soft stewed meat and onion slices covered in delicious gravy. Good lord, that sounds delicious. An excellent way to end a rather dull day, if one discounts the morning kerfuffle. The meal does the trick. It fills my belly and makes me extremely drowsy. I down one glass of water and quickly wash up before I retreat to the bedroom. I take great care while undressing, folding my clothes gently onto the chest. 
As I slip into the linens, I dart my gaze between the warm fire and the hearth and the cold world outside. I hope Brannock's un- comfortable. I'd like to imagine he's camping out there in the woods, looking into f- looking into similar flame, hopefully with similar longing. Good luck, Wolf. See you soon. I close my eyes and simply drift away into the memory of his warm embrace. Oh, let me drink some water because I'm probably going to have to do the voice. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. The gray wolf fills my dreams, his scent, his kind gaze, and the way his fur feels against my naked skin. Oddly enough, I'm aware it's just a wish away. However, I give into it completely. Despite him barely leaving, I'm already starved for his presence and his image gives me peace. I spend the night in this sweet surrender until a sudden jolt stirs me up. The world is shaking and I'm bouncing up and down, almost leaping out of bed in a complete confusion when everyone comes to a, when everything comes to a halt. Good, finally awake. I sit there, looking dumbfounded and clutching my chest as the black wolf lets go of the bed frame. What the fuck, fool? For a moment, he narrows his eyes at my familiarity, but decides to let it slide. I was knocking for a good while. You were sleeping like a rock. Indeed, it I mean, I've been one of the calmest nights I've experienced so far, up to this point. I throw my gaze towards the window, only to be met with by darkness. It's the middle of the night. Just before dawn, actually. We have work to do. I know Rennick has a tendency to be a good den mother, but, in- by encourage- but encouraging idleness and sloth does not nurture a strong character. I blink at him in slight annoyance. Sloth? I was sleeping! Quite comfortably as well, inside your master's bed. When the wolf's away, the wards play. The male scoffs, and I'm not entirely sure if he's teasing anymore. I've been sleeping here for the past week. I notice his brow raising in curiosity and realize that perhaps I shouldn't have said that. And where was he? Um, on the kitchen floor. He looks back into the other room with clear discomfort and then gives me a rather patronizing stare. You shouldn't abuse his hospitality like that. It's his bed and he needs to be rested to perform his duties. I don't think admitting we share the bed would sit well with the black wolf, so I decide to shrug it off. Besides, it's none of his business what sleeping arrangements we have. He insisted. Hmm. Anyway, thanks for the gentle wake-up, I mumble ironically, rubbing my sleepy eyes. If you don't hear an intruder into your bedchamber, be happy it was shaking that stirred you up and not a dagger. I've already met your dagger. I wink at him, giving myself an idle stretch and flopping my arms onto the bedding. Besides, you're talking as if you have to be on edge all the damn time. Maybe not at home, but with camping out here, out there, being vigilant is the only thing that keeps you firmly in the land of the living. Now get up. I'll start the fire. Renning made me promise that I'll feed you well. As if a butcher would starve a piglet. He mutters, disappearing into the kitchen. I throw off the covers and am immediately met by the extremely chilly morning. Perhaps the coldest one yet, my teeth begin to chatter. Damn this weather! It could make up could make up its own mind? What did you expect? It's early spring. I can hear his rustle around, pieces of wood clanking together as he arranges them securely within the hearth. We'll also need to get you some firewood. Swinging an axe will be a good experience, considering your twigs for arms. I frown, looking over my naked body. I approach the chest and caress the folded dress. I half wonder if it's a good idea for me to wear it. One, I don't want to aggravate the male, but two, would be a shame to soil it in the butchery. Don't put it on, he says, appearing in the doorway and causing me to wince half, and causing me to wince half expecting another outburst. Yet he seems oddly indifferent. It might be yours now, but I still paid for it. If you ruin it, we'll have to have a little chat. He sneers and pretty much confirms my assumption. Silk dresses are not good at a butchery. It's cold, though, I mumble, looking at him in slight discomfort. You can put on one of Rannick's cloaks, like you did before. It'll get warmer once the sun comes out anyway. I nod. In truth, it'll be some comfort having a piece of my wolf around, especially with how testy Vool can be. My wolf. <laughs> All right. I join him in the kitchen, seeing the fire already dance merrily. Walking to the cupboard, I, sh- I find the same old water in the bowl. I open the window and simply toss it outside. I brought you fresh water from the spring. It's in the bucket by the door. The black wolf points out, and I nod in gratitude. Is there a spring nearby? Close enough. He responds indifferently as I lit up the, as I lift up the handle. It's quite heavy, but I'm not going to complain in front of him. He'll just call me a weakling again in his, wor- in his words of choice. Save some in the jug for cooking and drinking. The rest you can use for wash-up. I nod, looking at the task at hand with worry. The bucket isn't big enough to dunk the pitcher in it. And I know I won't be able to lift it high enough without making a huge spill. Suddenly, I have an idea. I grab the pitcher and secure it beneath the bucket as I balance, the, as I balance it on the edge of the table. That's it. Mind over matter every time. I tilt it gently, allowing the water to spill over the edge right into the jug's opening, while I secure a pan in the fireplace. 
I place the bucket heavily onto the floor, looking back at the wolf. He's either ignoring me or trying to pretend he's not paying attention, but I immediately recognize the familiar, satisfied flickers of his tail. They might have a built-in heart rate monitor, but their tails are instant mood giveaways. I just shake my head and decide to continue with my morning routine. I need to use the privy, if you don't mind. Why would I? He shrugs, and I take, in, I take it as his approval for me to take my leave. Hmm. Oh, dear. Water! Once I'm back, I can hear the eggs and bacon already sizzling happily on the hot plate as I approach the cupboard. I wash up, trying not to complain too much about how cold the water is. Oh! Alright, guys, we're gonna go ahead and pause it right there. It's been a new episode of Far Beyond the World. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and give super thanks if you can. It's always appreciated. Until the next video, I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!